Namaste and welcome to another edition of the Bharat Vartha Weekly. I'm Roshan Karyapa. I have with me Nirav Kanodra and Abhishek Paul to run you through the news and events of the week that was. Bhutan, in a sudden shift, has claimed that China is also a party in the Doklam dispute. This is a major, major headache for India as the Doklam Valley is a strategically important location. This region is vital to India's security as it overlooks the Siliguri corridor, which connects the seven sister states in the northeast to the rest of the country. And also, in a series of events uh, in the China-Taiwan saga, Honduras has cut all ties with Taiwan and has recognized the One China policy. Several small EU countries such as Czech Republic, uh, Lithuania, etc. have increased their support for Taiwan. Taiwanese President Tsai Ing-wen visited the US on an official visit and this has angered the Chinese. So, Abhishek, Nirav, a lot happening on this front. Why don't you guys educate us? So, on the Bhutan front, what happened is there is an interview of the Bhutan PM Lote sharing uh, with a Belgian newspaper which came out. And the sort of big revelation in that was that he said that China has not made any intrusions or built any uh, villages on Bhutanese territory. Now, how this is being interpreted is that most sort of observers and scholars of the region who look at the maps, etc. say that China has built about 10 villages in what is sort of commonly accepted as Bhutan's territory. So now either the maps were all wrong, right? Or Bhutan is sort of quietly ceding over territory to China. Now, uh, the ba- some other background to this is that there were talks between China and Bhutan bilaterally a few months back. And so one of the speculations is that Bhutan might be willing to cede some land on the places on the borders where China has already built these villages in return for something. Now it's not necessarily clear, right? What is that something? You also talked about the whole Doklam thing. So on the Doklam front, I actually feel uh, the prime minister's statement there was not particularly new or different. He sort of maintained their official position that there are three parties at the tri-junction of Doklam, right? And all three parties are um, equally important and any settlement or any negotiation on Doklam will have to involve all three parties, which are uh, Bhutan, India and China. So I would say the more concerning part was uh, on this Uh, villages related um, statement where he said that China is actually not intruded. So I was listening to Shekhar Gupta's video on the print channel discussing all this. So he gave one more interesting sort of background information, which is that uh, so the Chinese via their uh, Global Times newspaper, right, has been trying to stir up this topic recently and Um, So the Chinese say that um, it is the East India Company and the British which kind of took over land or territory from the Bhutanese, right? And then which has subsequently become parts of India. So the Chinese are trying to sort of stir up passions among the Bhutanese by saying that, look, these Indians occupy your territory via, you know, the historical route of the British and the East India Company and so on, right? Like areas like the Duars in uh, the Northeast of India and so on. So that was one interesting uh, point. And then they also say that it is India which kind of uh, uh, interferes in Bhutanese politics and they give the background since the 1950s, right, where India has always been allocating funds for Bhutan's development, right, through from Nehru to Narendra Modi, right. I think the latest sort of we have some 4,000 plus crores supposedly to be invested for Bhutan's development, right. So what India says is, of course, it's, we are helping a neighbor of ours, right, in terms of its infrastructure development or things like that, while China is sort of branding it as, uh, you know, interference in another country, which essentially they do throughout the world. 
funnily enough. So yeah, I think uh, this is like one more thing that obviously our own foreign ministry and diplomats will have to be keeping close eye on in terms of what other developments might be happening here. Over to Nirav for the Taiwan thing. Yeah, so sure. This is also like very interesting part which is happening is a uh, Taiwanese leader, Tsai Ing-wen, uh, she is visiting the US. And uh, this is angering China because he, China believes like there is like one China policy where Taiwan is a part of China. Whereas Taiwan, which calls itself Republic of China, as, is, as in like the other one is People's Republic of China. It maintains its independence. It's a democratic country. And uh, one of the reasons why they are going there is uh, under the CHIPS Act in the US, Taiwanese semiconductor manufacturers, TSMC in particular, is setting up an Arizona plant and they want a no double taxation treaty for Taiwanese corporates. Now, Taiwan's status is not really a country as per the UN resolution, right? What is a country is it has a proper demarcated border, it has a stable population and it has the ability of maintaining relationship with other countries. And that is not there. Earlier, Taiwan, which was Republic of China till the 70s was the UN member. And then it became uh, the People's Republic of China came in and then Republic of China is not there. Even in the Olympics, it's called Chinese Taipei, right? So this is like a uh, ambiguity and the US policy towards China is a policy of strategic ambiguity where it kind of says, that, oh, it's a separate country, but it's not really there, etc. The Chinese do not like it and they, they have created a lot of tensions around that. At the same time, like in Taiwan, it's not all unilateral that everybody wants to be away from China or like more aligned with the US. So the current ruling party is called the DPP. So Democratic Progressive Party and the leader signing one is in the US. The reason, another reason, the double taxation thing is if US really wants to move like chips production to US from like Taiwan or East Asia, Taiwanese companies are at a big disadvantage because they're taxed twice. They're taxed in the US and then they're taxed in Taiwan. And uh, this kind of makes all the investments unviable. So US has like a lot of double taxation treaties with multiple countries, but now is Taiwan a country or no, but Taiwan has some relationship with others. So China is very upset about this. And there are a lot of these smaller countries in 1945 after World War II, when J Japanese occupation went off, there's a party came KMT, Kuomintang, which was the ruling party in China and uh, after in 1949, when the Communist Party took over, the leaders of Kuomintan, one of them was Chiang Kai-shek, they all ran away to Taiwan. They ran away to Taipei. They said, we are a country, we are ruling China, but in exile right now, etc. Till like the 70s. And that was the kind of feeling there. So a lot of these countries like Honduras, they had diplomatic relationship with Taiwan and not with China. Or like some of them had with both. So. China is trying to pressurize some countries to drop their recognition of Taiwan or like pull out the embassy. But this, to be fair, Honduras is also a very small country. Taiwan is a small country and uh, you will struggle to find it on the map. And it does not have any big geopolitical relevance. Taiwan has a like huge relevance right now due to the whole semiconductor industry and their lead in the design of like very advanced ship, design and manufacturing of advanced ships and also is the Taiwanese companies which are assembling iPhones, etc. So this is uh, something which is there. Now at the same time, the opposition party in Taiwan, which is the KMT, which was the earlier ruling party before DPP, their leader, Ma ying is actually visiting China. And now this party's thing is about having greater cooperation with China, somewhat sort of like a Hong Kong-China relationship where you have your own local leaders, you have your own currency, you have a lot of strategic autonomy, but kind of with like the be uh, blessings of Beijing. So people are also divided along these lines. Uh, you also see that in the center, the ruling party is the DPP, but in a lot of local elections recently, uh, KMT came back in power. Uh, one of the major thing is the mayor of Taiwan is actually a descendant of Chiang Kai-shek is from the KMT now. So there is a lot of friction. There's a lot of moving parts and very interesting for India. India kind of does not recognize, does not have like a full embassy like in Taiwan, but 
again, like the US has some sort, it doesn't call it strategic ambiguity, but does follow that kind of a policy. Uh, we have uh, Taiwanese assembly guys, Foxconn, uh, Vistron, Pegatron being the big three who are assembling iPhones in India. Foxconn with Vedanta is trying to set up a semiconductor plant as well in uh, Gujarat, right? So I think there are a lot of uh, moving parts here. It is very interesting, right? This is a very, very interesting time. Uh, 2024, you have elections in Taiwan as well. Now you do see, does the more pro-US party win or does the more pro-China party win, right? So that is also very critical. And there's a lot of worry around the Taiwan Strait where uh, will China take in some military action and try to take it over uh, for TSMC and a lot of other semiconductor companies? Uh, do they think that they have a lot of key uh, manpower as well as key technology? And is does diversification make sense that uh, they're trying to set up something in Germany? They're trying to set up something in Arizona. And that is TSMC, which is the most advanced semiconductor company. But also uh, you're seeing like Japan and Netherlands, which sell equipment, which is advanced lithography machines to uh, TSMC uh, to make those uh, semiconductors, right? So they are the equipment to make uh, uh, three nanometer and five nanometer chips. They are now blocking uh, any sales to China. So I think this is all regarding this key technology. Uh, these are all the key players. So for TSMC, does it need to be associated with Taiwan itself or can it be globalized? and uh, set up plants all over the world. India wanted TSMC to set up, but unfortunately that's not happening. And we won't be building the most advanced chips, but maybe the older generation chips, which are still used and used in many things, but like it gets us up the curve, right? On from like electronics assembly to like some manufacturing of electronics and some design, etc. So this is very, very interesting times. Uh, I would say that there's no clear winner. So 2024 is very interesting. You got uh, Taiwan elections earlier in the year, you got India elections middle of the year, you got the US elections end of the year, right? Uh, so a lot of moving parts. We're going in for a very interesting time and uh, we really don't know what happens, right? I don't want to take any sides, don't want to predict any winners, uh, but I think the sensible thing to do is to try and diversify and de-risk even at the risk of a higher cost. And that is what uh, Taiwanese companies are doing corporates that they have a lot invested in China, right? Uh, how do they kind of de-risk from China in case of a flashpoint between the two? They are caught between uh, two uh, superpowers, right? This is like one small country with one technological edge caught between two huge superpowers and it has the critical ingredient, you know, it's like, it's very, very interesting times. And uh, I, this is my hope as always is in the cold war between US and China, how does India try and get a foothold in and make some uh, benefit out, like get some benefit out of this whole tensions here?